Hello friends, here on my channel I do a couple of different things. I try to present new ideas here and there, try to build my own gadgets, but I also do repairs of older devices and or modify them. And in order to make these things happen in the real world, a lot of different disciplines often have to come together. And in my case, most prominently maybe those are power electronics and metalworking. And well, what's directly at the crossroads between those two fields for example, welding machines. And that's why I made a video about maybe the most inexpensive and primitive type of welding machine, what people call a stick welder, a manual metal arc welding machine about two years ago. We took a look inside and found out that it was based on a special type of transformer that I called a stray field transformer with an adjustable magnetic shunt. And I explained a lot of the principles behind well, power transformers and welding machines in that video, you can find it in the video description and I recommend you to watch that as well if you're interested in this video. Now, what I'm going to do in this video is a little different. We're going to take a look inside a much heavier, more expensive and complicated machine, often called a Mi'kmaq welder. And it's 50 years old, so a lot of things here are broken. I will fix them and then make some modifications based on more modern parts and electronics. And that's what I'm going to show you in this episode. Now, a lot of people are going to wonder why even bother to repair something this ancient if you can just go to your next home improvement store and buy a Mi'kmaq welder for relatively little money these days. Well, here we are in a German home improvement store. Let's take a look what they have to offer here. This is a 250 euros Mi'kmaq welder. Let's take a look at its nameplate then. And I'm not going to explain all the numbers on here right away, but I'll try throughout the video. Let's focus on the most important things for now. Here we have a bunch of symbols. And this here tells us that the machine is fed by single phase AC, which is then electrically isolated inside. And this happens by a type of isolation transformer, the welding transformer, which is directly connected to the single phase AC, which means that this is not an inverter type machine, but powered by a mains transformer. And then on the secondary side of that transformer, we see a diode symbol, a rectifier symbol, and then the symbol for direct current. So this machine is putting out a direct current. Here we have a reading called U0, and that's the same as V0, voltage zero, open circuit voltage of the machine. And that means that when you're not welding, the maximum voltage that you're going to measure between the welding gun and the ground clamp is 40 volts DC. And that already goes to show that welding machines of this type do not have to put out high voltages. A lot of people think that, but for welding, you actually, generally speaking, need high currents, not voltages. And we also find a bunch of current ratings out here for the value I2, and that's the output current while welding. And the maximum value that we can see here is 135 amps. And now typically a machine like this would be advertised as a 135 amps Mi'kmaq welder. But if you see the numbers for the value X, and that means on time or duty cycle in German Einschaltdauer ED, it reads 10% here. And that means that the machine can put out 135 amps, but only for 10% of the time or otherwise it will just overheat and shut down. While the values for 100% are between 25 and 42 amps on here. And 42 amps is probably on its best day. So it's maybe safe to say that this is more a 30 amps Mi'kmaq welder than a 135 amps Mi'kmaq welder. Now here we are back in my garage and this footage by the way is over two years old because that's when I bought this machine and some of the footage was still filmed in my old shop. Now this machine is very large and very heavy and that's because it was built for 200 amps at 100% ED. So in other words, it is at least five, six, seven times more capable than the machine from the home improvement store, at least in terms of its power source. And I paid 150 euros for this old thing here. And if I can get it back running, I will have a much more capable machine than what you saw for 250 bucks in that home improvement store. And here we're looking at another very important part of these machines, the wire feeder. And here in this home improvement store machine, we can see that the wire feeder is very minimalistic. 
and some of the parts are even made from plastic. Also, there is no port or connector that would allow us to connect any other type of welding gun, for example, with a much longer cable to this machine. You're stuck really with what you have. And in the machine here in my garage, we can see that it actually has two separate enclosures and that's because the wire feeder was put in its own enclosure, which can be somewhat separated from the power source. And the idea of that was that while the transformer, the power source is very heavy and should stay stationary somewhere in your workshop, you could then move around the wire feeder like a suitcase that is attached via a well wire package to the power source. And we're opening that and we can already see a massive construction style from steel and brass parts, a massive DC motor and well, the difference in quality couldn't be any more obvious. But I'm actually still stuck here in my garage with the two components still being connected together. And the first thing that I'm doing here is to open the back side of the wire feeder in order to disconnect the wires and the gas tube connecting the two enclosures together because I couldn't well, carry both of these things at the same time into my house. They were too heavy. So now the thing is that I first want to focus on the power source. We will make a tear down. I will show you all its different components and I will analyze how it's working. And then I will modify this entire thing, give it a new front panel and some other functionalities because I want to use this as a general purpose power source for future experiments. For example, for self-built uh, welding machine stuff. And that is why I will now try to first get the power source running so they can do stick welding with it. Then I will repair the wire feeder, put the two parts back together and in the end of the video we'll then be able to Mi'kmaq weld with this as well. So I'm opening the main enclosure and what I found here first is a large three-phase power transformer. Now a lot of people around the world are going to say what the heck am I supposed to do with a three-phase power device like this? I don't have three-phase power at home thing is in Germany that basically every household has three-phase power. Now some people might think, well, wait a minute, I don't have three-phase sockets in my house. Yeah, that's true, but still your flow heaters, ovens, cookers, electric heaters in general in Germany are built for three-phase power. And even if you don't have any visible signs like sockets or outlets on your walls that tell you that you have three-phase power, if you look inside your breaker box, you will most probably find the three phases coming into your house and probably leading into your kitchen and going to the cooker and so on. So the next thing for me to do now was to take apart the entire current source. And that meant to take out all the different components from inside this enclosure, use the opportunity to clean these parts, make some measurements and figure out how it's all working together. And I'm now going to show you the different components. And then after that, I'm going to show you a circuit diagram explaining how they all work together. Now, the first thing that I'm removing here are the wires connecting the two enclosures and this very thick wire here that is attached to one end of this massive inductor is of course carrying the welding current itself. It's the positive side of the output of the machine leading to the wire feeder and to the welding gun. And this part here is a valve, a gas valve that is activated when you push the button on the welding gun, transporting the welding gas from the gas cylinder to the tip of the welding gun. So with that valve gone, it was now possible to remove the back panel as well and to access the inductor and another part that is installed under it. It looks like a heat sink at first, and it is, but on that heatsink there are several diodes installed and they form a three-phase rectifier bridge. And we're going to take a closer look at the inductor and the bridge in just a minute on the workbench. And after having removed that large inductor from the enclosure, we can now see that there is a fan installed between the welding transformer and the rectifier bridge. And I'm now preparing that rectifier bridge to be taken out as well. And I do that by labeling all the different connections with little self-made stickers. 
And I have actually done that with all the different connections in this device throughout this teardown. And I always recommend to do that in addition to filming yourself if you really want to make sure that you know how to put things back together again after having taken something apart. And in the next step, I now unscrewed the rotary switches on the front panel in order to take that panel off. And now we can have a good look through the front side of the enclosure. And here we have a close up of the primary side taps, 27 all in all of the three phase transformer. And down here, we can see a switchboard with different mounting posts and a smaller single phase transformer also with lots of taps on it. And then going to a bunch of electronics on the back side of the front panel. But these rather complicated looking parts here are only necessary in order to operate the motor control for the wire feeder. And in order to switch on and off all the different parts of this device. While the current source actually only relies on a bunch of very fundamental components. So let's take a closer look at them and then try to understand how the welding current source works. And here we have our rectifier bridge. And if you take a closer look, you can see that there are little discrete components mounted onto the heatsink. And these are 24 high current rectifier diodes. Why so many? Well, I'll explain to you in just a minute. And here is our heavy duty inductor. As you can see, it was just wound from massive copper bar and the individual turns are separated by some insulator material that wouldn't interact with the inductor in any other way, really. And you have no iron core or other core material, which would mean that this inductor probably has a very low inductance. And I've now added a piece of wire so that I can attach my LCR meter and we're measuring around 100 microhenries, which of course is not a lot. But because of the relatively large cross section area and surface of this copper bar, this inductor would be able to handle hundreds of amps. And here we have the fan from inside the enclosure. As you can see, it has a motor capacitor. And this, of course, is an induction motor with motor capacitor. And as you can see, it's not running very roundly and smoothly anymore. It seems to be kind of unbalanced, but it's probably not a mechanical problem, but rather just the capacitor that has lost some of its capacitance over the last 50 years. So it should probably be replaced. And here are the rotary switches that are used to adjust the current limit for the welding current and I'm using a continuity tester to find out what exactly they're doing. And here I am measuring the different connections and inductances of the tabs on the three phase transformer. So after having gathered all this information, I can now explain to you how these parts are working together. Okay, so in order to understand how these components work together, we'll have to talk a little bit about the basics of three phase power first. Now three phase power exists all over the world is used in industries everywhere, but you won't necessarily find it in your average household in many countries. While in Germany, you actually do, as I mentioned before. So for example, if you have a three phase outlet or socket in your garage or workshop, you will then typically find five distinct physical conductors in there, L1, L2, L3, the three phases, then N, the neutral conductor, and PE, the protective earth. And you will then be able to measure three distinct voltages between L1 and L2, 400 volts, L2 and L3, 400 volts, and L3 and L1, also 400 volts. Now, some people are wondering probably, wait a minute, I thought they had like 230 volts over in Europe. Well, that's true, but that's not the voltage measured between phases, but between one of the phases and the neutral conductor. So when you measure the voltage between L1 and N, L2 and N, L3 and N, you will always measure a value somewhere around 230 volts AC. And if you are in a normal living room and not in your garage or workshop, you will probably just have a single phase outlet on the wall and that single phase outlet is simply connected to the neutral conductor and one of the three phases. So whenever you're using single phase AC in a country like Germany, you're actually using only a part of a larger system that is actually a three phase system. So as I said before, a large part of the welding machine is basically just a current source. 
So what I will do now is to try to develop for you the idea of this current source of this welding power supply from a more common single phase power supply as I have used it for example in my self-made lab power supply. So let's do that and work with just one phase for now. Okay, so what will you typically find in a power supply that is still based on a mains transformer and is not yet a switch mode power supply? Well, there have been really different stages of development throughout the 20th century and, well, let's get through them a little bit. Now, first of all, you have, of course, your mains transformer with a primary winding that is directly attached, well, here in this case, between one of the phases and the neutral. And then you have, for example, one secondary winding that will provide you, for example, with a lower voltage. And one thing that they then did from early on is to provide the secondary winding with tabs and a rotary switch so that you could choose between different output voltages on the secondary side of the mains transformer. The other end of that rotary switch and one end of the secondary winding would then lead typically to a full bridge rectifier. On its output side you will then often find a capacitor, typically an electrolytic capacitor, but it can also just be a non-polarized capacitor of any kind. In higher quality power supplies, back in the 50s and 60s for example, you will then also find an inductor in addition to the capacitor actually creating a real LC filter and that would work much better than just using a capacitor or electrolytic capacitor, but it would also be much more expensive. Later on then they developed linear regulators to regulate the output voltage of a power supply and they first did that sometimes with vacuum tubes, but it only really happened when first germanium and then silicon bipolar transistors were invented and became affordable. Later on then you had cheap integrated linear regulators like the LM317 and LM7805 and so on, which were like built in billions of devices. And the last stage of development of these conventional power supplies with mains transformers was then to add a switching converter, like here a buck converter, to the secondary side of the power supply with, for example, a MOSFET that was switched on and off periodically by some kind of control circuit, providing it with a pulse width modulation. The next stage in development then really was to build real switch mode power supplies as we understand them today, but those are switched not on the secondary, but on the primary side with a pulse width modulation. That is why it's then possible to use ferrite core transformers with much higher frequencies so that mains transformers became altogether obsolete. But if you already have your powerful mains transformer, you might as well work with a switching converter on the secondary side. And that is what they did with some welding machines as well. And I will try to build some kind of upgrade module to use that for old welding machines like this one. But that's a project for the future. So let's try to work our way backwards then from the circuit diagram to the actual circuit used in the welding machine from 67. Of course it doesn't have any switching converters neither on the primary nor on the secondary side. It also has no linear regulators that would be ridiculous at these kinds of power outputs. And we're basically at this stage of development here. Only that we also remove the capacitor. Well why is that? Well. See, a lab power supply is built to regulate the output voltage and to deliver smooth, constant output voltages. But a welding machine actually works on the principle of delivering controlled output currents. Even though they're not really constant, they are at least limited to a certain point. And having a capacitor directly at the output is contrary to that. Because Imagine you basically short circuit the welding gun and your ground clamp, which well virtually happens every time you weld, then the capacitor at the output would just instantaneously discharge into your welding process, into your welding arc. And that would mean that for a very short moment in time you would have a potentially gigantic current spark and that could just blow a hole, for example, through a sheet of metal that you're trying to weld carefully, maybe with just five amps. So having a capacitor at the output, at least for this type of welding machine, doesn't make any sense. However, we keep the inductor. Now, why do we keep the inductor? Well, 
I want to show you this with an experiment in a future video. But let me just say for now, we want to have nice smooth output currents and an inductor can help with that. But there's another big difference between welding machines, the one that I fear, but also other welding machines that use rotary switches to adjust the welding current to the circuit diagram here. And that is that they typically don't have tabs on the secondary winding at all, but that they have tabs on the primary winding. Now, why did they do that with welding machines? Well, see, welding machines typically generate much higher currents in the secondary winding. That means that all the conducting parts in the secondary circuit have to be rated for much higher currents, have to have much larger cross-section areas. That is not only true for the heavy wires that you use for welding, but also for your rotary switches if you have them on the secondary side. So a secondary side switch that can potentially switch 200 amps is much heavier, much bulkier, much more expensive than one that maybe only has to switch 30 amps or 15 amps or whatever on the primary side. So that is why you typically find them on the primary side in welding machines. But we have also seen that in this case, we don't just have one switch, but actually two rotary switches. And then we also notice that the general number of tabs on that power transformer is rather large. So why is that? Well, it's handy to have the option to jump between a wide range of welding currents in relatively large steps, but you also want to allow for a fine adjustment of the welding current. And that is why they went for a combination of a whole number of switches and a whole lot of tabs on that welding transformer. But keep in mind that this circuit diagram still only shows a single phase design while our actual machine is three phase powered. But let's say we remove the rather expensive inductor at the output side and then maybe design the power transformer so that it has a little more leakage inductance, then we might actually be pretty close here to what you would find in many of the really cheap single phase powered Mi'kmaq welders. But let's say you really wanted to weld with 200 amps at 25 volts DC. Well, then you would already have an output power of 5000 watts and that's already more than a single phase outlet here in Germany could deliver. So what you basically have to do is you have to go for a three phase design. So just imagine that we just forget about the neutral conductor altogether and then connect a transformer between two of the phases. And then we would not just use one, but three transformers, each connecting to two of the three phases. So what we have done now is to connect the three primaries of three transformers in what is called a Y configuration, meaning that they all meet in one point, which in German is called Sternpunkt, which means star point directly translated. And the three remaining connections on the primaries then go to the three phases. The secondaries on the other side can then, for example, be connected in a triangle or delta configuration. And because we want to rectify the output voltage or current as well, we need another rectifier bridge. But this is a three phase power supply and we need a three phase rectifier bridge. And for that, we can just take our full bridge rectifier and add another diode half bridge like this. And let me put some space between those parts. You'll see why in a minute. And the secondaries can then be connected to the rectifier bridge just like this. And now our inductor can be placed at the output just like before. And now imagine that if you have the required knowledge about magnetic fluxes and magnetic materials, that you would be able to put all these windings not on three separate, but one unifying magnetic core and that is what a three phase transformer is. So please don't take this particular drawing here as gospel. It's just a symbolic approach in order to form an idea in your mind of how a very specialized welding power supply could be developed from the idea of a general purpose power supply as it is found in all kinds of electronic devices. One last question though. How come that there are only six diodes here in the diagram, while we clearly saw that on that heatsink there were a lot more discrete diodes attached? Well, the answer here is that we are welding with very high currents and we want to spread that current to as many parallel rectifiers as possible so that the heat that is dissipated in the diodes is also spread across all those diodes and across a large heatsink. 
So in reality, a bunch of diodes were just connected in parallel here to really bulk up the three phase rectifier. Okay, so this video is almost 25 minutes long already and I've been talking just about the theory behind the power supply for the last 10 minutes or so. So it's just not realistic that I'll be able to cover the wire feeder and my self-made motor controllers for that in this video as well. So we'll have to do that in a part two to this video. Without a working wire feeder, we can do MIGMAC welding though. But what we can do just with a power supply is to do MMA or stick welding. So let me make some practical modifications to this machine and then let's see if this current source even works at all. So the first real modification that I made to this device is to replace the old fan by a new one. Why did I do that in the first place? Well, while testing that old fan, I noticed that the blades had gotten extremely brittle over the years and that parts were breaking off all the time while doing the test. So I decided to take this salvaged server fan here that runs on 12 volts DC, mount that on some pieces of steel and then install that between the power transformer and the rectifier diodes. Now later on we will have to build a 12 volt DC supply rail into this machine. We'll do that in part two. I've actually already done that but you'll see. And then the next thing was that I decided to throw away the old front panel and all of the electronics that were used for the old motor controller, which was no longer working. But that is something that I will also add in part two. For now, I just cut out a piece of aluminum with an angle grinder and I drilled a lot of holes into it with my drill press. I then installed a bunch of connectors. See, before we really had no actual plus pole connector or port on the front panel because that would just lead by a wire in the back side to the wire feeder. But now we also want to allow this machine to be used for stick welding. So I installed a connector for the plus pole on the front panel. The next thing was then, and now you can see we're in the new workshop and in 2017, I, well, reconnected everything, including the switches and installed them on the new front panel. And now let's just do a first really load test here with just ordinary welding electrodes and do some kind of MMA here, some kind of stick welding at maximum power at 200 amps. So this is not really welding, but just testing if the power supply does even work. Okay, so I tried that for a couple of minutes with different current settings and it all seemed to work just fine. But I couldn't do it for too long. Remember that 12 volt fan isn't running yet because we don't have a 12 volt DC rail in there yet. But well, as of today, in reality, the machine is already completed and I have done a bunch of repairs and modifications here and a lot of work went into this. So it's actually completed and I have already done some Mi'kmaq welding with it, but I can't show it to you yet today because I still have to do the editing and sound recording. But it's Christmas Eve tonight and well, you can't really expect me to go on work in the day, right? So I wish all of you a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. See you soon, guys.